Good morning. Morning. It's really great to be here. I'll explain a little bit more why that is. Um, we're Brad and Gina Shaw, and we've served in Peru, South America, as uh, some of your missionaries since 1999. 23 years. And we live and the minister in the Cotahuasi Canyon, which is in the south of the country, where the Quechua people live. They're farmers and they live in small scattered villages all over this canyon area, which they claim is the deepest canyon in the world. And then there's shepherds that live on the high plateau areas, really high plateaus, like up to 16,000 feet. And they actually live up there on these wind-blown, cold prairie areas, and they have their alpacas and their llamas, and uh, they're way far away from civilization. And they, most of them, know nothing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. In 1985, Gene and I were actually, before we were missionaries, we were actually working uh, with the National Park Service in Alaska. And we were really enjoying God's creation and looking forward to settling into adventurous lives there. But through our church and learning more of the scriptures, God began to show us the reality of a world filled with lost people who had never had the opportunity to hear and understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. And our first cross-cultural ministry experience was serving with the Athabascan Indians in, in northern Alaska, north of the Arctic Circle, for a few days. And the Lord used that experience to further open our eyes to God's heart in calling us to go and make disciples. That's really what he's calling us all to do, is go Amen. and make <laughs> disciples, where he has placed us and the Holy Spirit that's in us yearns for us, desires that we involve ourselves in worrying about others and their eternal souls. So we really understood that and felt that and uh, began to look for opportunities. <clears throat> we found some training opportunities for short-term mission experience, and then uh, we obeyed the Lord to minister uh, in the, to the Balinese in Indonesia, and then the Ifugao people in northern Philippines, and then the Tarahumara Indians in northern Mexico. Um, we tried to learn how to compassionately share the gospel with other people, and we discovered that healthcare was a good way to do that because we could um, show people the love of Christ, show that we cared for them and perhaps open the doors for opportunity to explain to them who Jesus Christ really is. And uh, so we did that in those places and realized this was such a great opportunity that I decided to return to university to study medicine. And afterward, we arrived here in Alamosa in 1994 to work as a PA at Valleywide. As we continued preparing for missions. It was always our hope. And we really understood that God was preparing us little by little for something in the future. We didn't know what that was, but we wanted to be faithful with everything. And so we involved ourselves with ministry here and uh, wherever we were at. <clears throat> this was our church. We were part of this body. And so that's why it's precious for us to come and be with you here and, and see what God is doing and fellowship with you and take communion with you. It's really a special thing for us. And so for 23 years, we've served the Lord alongside a team of Quechua Indian believers in the Andes Mountains. And we're continuing with this healthcare ministry, but we're more focusing on evangelizing and discipling and preparing pastors and church planters 
to reach more remote areas where there is no true gospel witness. And for all this time, this church has joined us in this way of worshiping Christ, magnifying his name, telling the world how great Jesus Christ is and what he has done for them. So we want to say thank you so much for helping us and sending us, and praying for the work, and the people and coming to visit us, and helping us with hands-on work, and faithfully supporting the work over the years. Pastor Jaron and Greg Bervig brought teams down to serve with us, which was a great encouragement to us in the Quechua ministry team. Some people ask us, well, are you the only ones there? And, you know, and it seems strange for us to hear that question because um, where we live, yeah, we're the only, what, Americans that are there, but around us, God has surrounded us with beautiful people and family there. And uh, the Quechua Indians are very much um, with us and a part of, like, a family. Some of them even live with us and have for years. The largest Native American Indian group are the Quechua Indians, and there are millions living throughout the Andes Mountains of Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, northern Argentina, and northern Chile. The Quechua people are really a beautiful display of God's creation and handiwork there in the Andes Mountains. They're beautiful people, but broken and suffering because of deep, dark sin and despair. Gene has prepared a short video, and we hope it helps you appreciate the people and the ministry there, and we're going to watch that now.
preparing to return to Peru on the 24th, which is coming up pretty soon, a couple of weeks, and uh, when we arrive, we'll be coordinating a week of seminary classes for our pastoral training program. Um, we have a small group of men who have really been faithful over the years and are already involved with ministry, and we really want to equip them better, and so they're in their second year, no, their third year now, starting. Uh, in seminary, and uh, there's a seminary in Peru, in uh, Mexico that's sending professors down to Peru, especially to train our men. We're really thankful for that. And then after that, there's another week there before we can get back home um, to to this place, to Cotahuasi Canyon, where we're going to be installing a shortwave transmitter and antenna, which will give us the opportunity to reach out about 500 miles. Um, radius where hundreds of thousands of potential listeners will receive quality Bible teaching in their own native Quechua languages. That's part of what our Quechua team is doing right now and over the years they've been recording the messages and, and so we're going to be putting that on the air. <clears throat> so this will be the culmination of many years of praying, planning and working to get the government permissions and the funds and equipment um, this has been a, a dream and, and a prayer for us for many, many years. You may have, well, I'm sure we've shared it with you many, many times. It's finally going to happen <laughs> in God's timing, right? Um, so we would really like this morning, or I would like to do that, Gina and I would like to share this morning some of the challenges we face so that you can know how to pray for us when ministering to the pagan and idolatrous people of, of Peru, so that you can understand their needs. Um, we ask that you would pray for us in considering join a, joining us and serving the ministry. He is worthy. He is worthy of all of Give him everything that he's given us to give back to him. There's a model that Jesus Christ and the Father has shown us in, in doing that. There's so many challenges ministering the gospel in this fallen, fallen world, isn't there? It's not easy. And no matter where you live, to which culture or people group you find yourself, it's necessary to focus on what God wants, not what we want. But it's hard. Interestingly, people seem to be the same wherever we've gone. I don't know if you found there or not and done some traveling, but you find that we're all designed by our Creator to worship. It's, it's in our nature to worship. We value and hope and trust in that which we believe can save us from suffering. And we all have the same problem, right? Sin. Even though we may not see it as the cause for our suffering, we all have it. It's our problem. Oftentimes we, we think we run after solutions to the effects of sin rather than the root of the problem. That's why we need each other, to help each other, to love each other enough, to help each other understand these things. And God offers us, all of us, the same solution for salvation from this destructive sin. They need the same thing we do, the one and only Savior Jesus Christ, 
they need the salvation of their souls through trusting solely in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. Latin America, it's interesting if you study the history of religion, history of the people, over the centuries, it's included many different practices and worship of different gods. Before the Spaniards and the Portuguese arrived, animism was the worldview and practice of the native people. Animism, to the animist, to the person practicing this, they see it, they fear the dangers of powerful forces in, in the natural world, not understanding them, not understanding the cause and effect. Why do they suffer? And it leads them to seek to appease the most powerful spirits that they can imagine with hope of saving themselves from pain and suffering. But to the Christian, animism is worshiping the creation of God rather than the creator. Mystical worship of powerful elements of the fallen world influenced by Satan and a world inhabited by demons who are willing and enabled to bring upon sinful people and the suffering and just consequences of their sin. Then after the Europeans arrived, the idolatry continued as new gods replaced the old ones. For Quechua people, the worship and sacrifices given to appease the goddess Mother Earth was named in Quechua Pachamama, Mother Earth, that's their main God. The worship and sacrifices that they would give to appease that Mother Earth goddess was transferred to the goddess of Mary as the Catholic Church deliberately syncretized the animistic beliefs into the newer religion. And it's hard to understand. Um, I was surprised. Uh, when going to Latin America and South America because um, the Catholic Church there was so much different than it is here. And the Catholic Church is able to, it's very capable of syncretizing. It's, it's mixing together. It's adapting the religion to the local religion and pragmatically creating another mix that's palatable and agreeable with the local people in order to capture their, their um, faithfulness. So here in the United States, the United States has, you know, the Catholic Church has kind of adapted the Protestant culture and ideas. They're much more sympathetic to the scriptures and, and those kinds of ideas. So what we see as a Catholic Church here in the United States isn't really the way it is in the rest of the world. In the rest of the world, there's much more idolatry there. And it's very, very, well, I'd say it's impossible to really get the true gospel through that religion. And of course, this new religion could not save or sanctify the people from their sin. And hundreds of years passed before the true gospel began to be preached in South America. But thanks to our Savior Jesus Christ, we can now give them the truth that sets them free. Amen? Amen? You know, our situation here in our modern day culture is not really that different from the pagan cultures of the past. We still have the same sinful nature and need the same salvation. Along with every other culture and people group, we recognize our weakness and vulnerability and we fearfully seek safety from the dangers around us. But if we don't know who God really is, we can't place our trust in him, can we? Right. We end up trusting in not the one true God in some way or some other God. And if we don't completely trust in him, who is uniquely trustworthy, the only one who is trustworthy, we will find other things or people to trust to save us from that which we fear. God calls this idolatry. 
Now, values are reflected in our choices, in our words, our use of time, what or who we spend our money on, where we spend it. In our culture, we tend to notice the idolatry of Eastern religions like Buddhism or Hinduism or his pagan worship of the trees and the animals. But idolatry is not only bowing down to statues and worshiping creation, but it's anything that means more to you than God does. Anything that means more to you than the precious Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. When getting what you want has become more important than what God desires for you, idolatry, idolatry really is present. And this idolatry is one of the main themes of God's revelation to us. Why does God speak to us so much about idolatry? It's so, so that we can, be, we can better understand our own hearts, our problem of sin, and the only real salvation God lovingly provides to his precious chosen people. The first commandment shows us how important this is for God. Exodus 20, verse 3 says, you shall have no other gods before me. He starts right out with that, doesn't he? In the scriptures, idolatry is the most frequently discussed problem for God's people. If we are to correctly understand what God is teaching us in much of the Bible, we really need to understand what idolatry really is and help each other understand that. As we love Christ and we love others, we need to love them enough to help them discover these idols that are oftentimes blind spots. We just don't, we just don't realize it. And we end up suffering, we're scratching our heads going, what? what's going on here? But we can help each other. It's really what God wants. He wants us to be a family where we love each other and we're concerned for each other and we're willing to help each other um, uncover these idols, right? Is idolatry only the pagan practices of animus, Buddhists, and Hindu people? Actually, all of us are idolaters by nature and practice. And as professing Christians, we confess Jesus as Lord. But we need to frequently check our own hearts and ask ourselves and each other, what really motivates me? What do I really value most? What are the greatest affections of my heart? In what or whom am I trusting? What do I trust in to solve my problems? Is Jesus really my Lord? Or am I maybe my own Lord, in effect? Asking Jesus Christ to come on to my team and help me be Lord of my own life. This is tough, isn't it? But really, that's what love does. Right? It calls us to see and understand and confess and repent. If we can better understand our tendency to trust in other things rather than Jesus Christ, we can begin to identify our own idols and grow in our faith and really help others to trust Christ more. So what could be an idol for you and me? Anything can become an idol, even a good thing, if we want it too much or trust in it too much. It is what we value apart from God, what we long for, what our hearts are set on. But it's hard to recognize our own idolatry even when our idols fail us and we suffer because of our sin. Jeremiah 17.9 tells us that our heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? It's really important that we not fall in the trap of trusting our own hearts, right? Who should we trust? 
Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, his word, his revelation to us to correct us. Let him correct us. <clears throat> you know, if we um, mistaken the one true God for something else, <clears throat> we can begin to doubt, especially when we have pain and suffering. We're tempted to doubt. Why me, God? Why is this happening to me? Why doesn't God give me relief from this? Why does it have to go on so long? Why does God allow this? He has good reason. His purposes are perfect. And he is love. He desires to mold us and make us into the image of Jesus Christ. He is going to pursue us and sanctify us and make us holy no matter what. If we doubt that Jesus doesn't love us, then we can respond with idols, pursuing love from others, belonging, acceptance, happiness. Family become, become, can even become an idol. Our spouses children, our parents, our reputation, respect, finances, retirement accounts, nationality, heritage, all these kinds of things. If we doubt that God is merciful, then success, achievements, affirmation of self from others, position, title, our business, our activities, they can become our idols. It's kind of weird, isn't it? And it's, it's, it takes a little bit of effort on our part and prayer to really see this. But this is what the Holy Spirit wants to show us through his word, the scriptures, and through others who are patiently trying to help us to maybe see our own idols. <clears throat> If we doubt that God desires, has the desire to deliver us, then we'll try to save ourselves or we'll look for anything that can save us desperately. Or maybe we doubt that God is powerful enough to do it. Maybe he wants to, but he's not powerful enough, right? So if we, if, if we think that or imagine that falsely, then we can respond trusting in control, position, authority, leadership, popularity, my uniqueness, my own ability, my powers, trying to build up kind of my own kingdom. Right? You know, when we think about these things, it's just you know, it's pretty ugly, isn't it? But it's important for us to uncover these things and learn how to practice the uncovering because this is a process. Our hearts constantly want to fall back into this thing whenever we doubt. We need each other to come together like this and encourage each other to trust in him who is trustworthy. If we imagine that God is not good, Maybe it's not so good. Then we can build idols um, desiring the absence of pressure and expectations or no conflict, a life without conflict, uh, pleasing of people, pleasure, escapes, and all that comes with addictions and those kinds of things. Okay, so that's just a sample. You know, and these things can pass through our lives and our, be in our hearts at different times of our lives, and things like that. But boy, if we can learn to identify these things and be sensitive to the Holy Spirit as he exposes these things, then we're going to be able to grow in holiness and we're going to be able to help others glorify our Lord Jesus Christ. God's design for his church 
his redeemed community of believers is to see us loving one another enough to actually encourage and correct each other, to see the sin. We live in a world that is radically self-centered and worships idol, the idol of autonomy. And this is becoming more and more and more um, difficult, this autonomy. So our message of surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and, and, and as his slaves is completely counter to the worldview that is around us and, and influencing us daily. You know what the word doulos means? It means slave. And uh, that was the original word that the apostles used when they wrote. They said they, they identified themselves, Paul, it says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Well, actually, that's, that should say slave. <laughs> well, you know, the reason it doesn't say slave is because it's so strong. But it's, that's what doulos means, slave. They were, they were proclaiming themselves to be slaves of Jesus Christ. We, too, are slaves of Jesus Christ. So we're not employees. We're not, it's not an optional thing. Jesus Christ came, and, and he saved us from a slave slave to unrighteousness, to sin. And now we're slaves to what? Righteousness. But we're slaves. It's not like we're going through as our own lords and deciding each day, you know, whether we're going to obey Jesus Christ or not. Really, that's not what we see in Scripture. If a slave obeys his master, he doesn't really have a choice, right? But our, this, this, this popular cult of radical autonomy is really, really distorting our whole understanding as believers of our relationship with God. It affects us. It influences us. Maybe this needs to be different for us. Maybe we need to completely surrender to Jesus Christ, everything in every way we can possibly do that. Even more, even, even those of us who have years in the faith, maybe there's more, more growing that God has for us. May God teach us and grant us the gift of repentance of the idolatry of self. Um, Unlike what most people imagine, God really isn't offering himself to serve the wrong agendas of people pursuing false hope and selfish, selfish solutions. But he is warning us and calling us to trust and obey him, who is Lord of Lords, and who really loves us, really loves us. What he promises he's going to do. Um, open your Bibles, please, to John 17, 17. The chapter of John 17 is an incredible prayer by Jesus Christ. It's, he's preparing and being prepared for the crucifixion. And I encourage you to read the whole chapter. It's not long. And it's full of understanding of this relationship that Jesus Christ has with the Father and the Father with Jesus Christ and the relationship that they have with us. Hmm? Oh, great. <laughs> Sanctify them in your truth, your word is truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify them in the truth. Jesus Christ is asking the Father to sanctify us. And if you read through that whole chapter, you find what pleases the Father and what pleases the Son. We exist for God's glory. We don't exist for our own benefit, our own glory. And we need to really shift our whole perspective on this, that his purposes for us are eternal and perfect. 
and ours are not. So surrendering to his lordship is essential. It's not a matter of, oh, I'm going to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior and maybe later on my Lord. They come together as a packet. And really, it could be argued that it's not possible to have Jesus Christ only as your Savior and not your Lord. Because he is Lord. He's always been Lord, and he always will be Lord of heaven and earth. So what pleases him is the giving and the receiving of the gift of a sanctified people. Can you see it? The Father giving the Son us as a gift. And then the Son justifying us on the cross and then gifting us back to the Father in a process of sanctification and the Trinity working together to mold us and make us into Christ's image. This is what pleases God. And it's amazing that you and I are gifts of love between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Father is giving his Son the gift of his people. And Jesus Christ is giving us back. Let's turn our Bibles to Philippians 1.6. Philippians 1.6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Paul encourages us to have confidence in God's willingness to transform us into his image and to trust that he indeed has the ability to do it. He not only wants to, but he has the ability and the power to do it. Let's not doubt that. Let's trust him. And with that trust, there is power, power to obey, power to confess and repent. God says that he will complete what he's begun to perfect us. And he's beginning this now as we love him by obeying him and growing to be more and more like him. You know how Jesus Christ recognizes our love for him? how he visually sees it. It's when we obey him, when we repent. Repentance is a beautiful thing because what it's saying is, not my will, but yours, Lord. Your will be done, not mine. It's, it's actually worship. Repentance is worship. And so, as difficult as it can be and discouraging when we discover our wicked hearts and our, our sin. And we wrestle with it. It can be discouraging. But we need to look at it as an opportunity to worship. I, I mean, do we have that op same opportunity if we're not recognizing our weakness and our sin? No, we, we, God allows us to go through these difficulties and situations and live in this fallen world and grow because this is an actual act of worship to him. And that's what we're created for. That's what we want to do. Amen? Amen? So it's our privilege to worship him through desiring, discovering, and obeying his will as God progressively sanctifies us into the image of Christ. And in this way, Christ is magnified in and through our lives as we deny our own desires and needs and invest what he has given us. To his glory and the eternal good of others. As he places his love in us, our goal is to see others bring glory to him through trusting him and worshiping him. Now, we are designed by God to worship, to value him above else. So, above all else. So, would it be helpful to us to ask, what and who are we worshiping? Who will we worship? 
to, to kind of test ourselves, to kind of evaluate ourselves. Of course, in our heads, we know that to worship Jesus is the only way. We know that. But the problem is in our hearts, our affections of the hearts. Matthew 22, 37 through 38. Matthew 22, 37 through 38. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is really key, isn't it? This is essential for our faith. It's so important to God and his children. John, in his first epistle, finishes his letter about love with a passionate and loving ending, saying, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. This is love, brothers and sisters. This is love. Jonah 2.8 tells us that those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. For the Christian, this is the grace of many blessings that God offers us when we walk faithfully, trusting Him. How sad when Christians trust in other people and things that are not worthy of trust instead of trusting Him who really is trustworthy. How are we doing on time? Okay. Okay. So what is happening in our hearts to cause us to not trust God? This is key to winning our constant battle with sin. You know, idolatry always, is always built on lies, the lies of Satan, the world, and self that present those lies to us, especially when we suffer or fear. But what lies? Well, we doubt. We doubt that God maybe doesn't care or love for me. We doubt that he's really sufficient, capable, and powerful enough to do what he wants to do. If we doubt and just don't understand who God really is, then we will try to save ourselves. It's like what Adam and Eve did when they believed Satan's lies. That they could become like God and obtain what they wanted, and that there would be no consequences, that they would not die. So what should we do? God wants us to ask him to uncover and reveal to us our personal idols. He's guiding us, each of us, to trust him completely. In John, I'm just going to read this to you, John uh, 4.10 and 13 and 14. Jesus answered to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Isn't this the theme of this very church? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up into him. Listen listen to him that you keep uh, living for him in his glory. Um, Psalm 139, 29 through 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. It's a plea from a believer with a heart to grow in holiness. He says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So what is it that we are anxious about? It's our idols usually. What if I don't get what I want? What if I lose it? But he is all wise with perfect wisdom and knowledge. He is all loving with a perfect love. Only he is worthy and good and trustworthy. Ask him to show you what your heart is trusting in. It's not easy, but it's totally necessary for all of us. Let's help one another to sort out these betraying idols that are stumbling blocks to our worship and fully enjoy the freedom in Christ that God offers his children
through the gospel. Amen? Amen. Okay. Thank you, Lord, for the sufficiency of your word, your work on the cross for us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. We need your help. We want to trust you only. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.